Hi everyone, my name is Maddie. Today we will be talking about international law and institutions. I think that this lecture is going to be helpful um, in the sense that it's a content-based lecture, not a debate stylistic lecture. Um, and so it'll help you respond to motions both that explicitly talk about international law and institutions um, that ask you to propose or oppose a motion that discusses the United Nations, that discusses NATO, um, that talks about permanent membership on the Security Council. Um, this is going to provide you some content knowledge and a foundation for those motions, um, but it's also going to be helpful, I think, to understand generally how international law works um, as a broad concept when you're responding to any motion um, in world schools. I think that it's going to help you um, construct arguments that invoke different processes of international law, um, that invoke an understanding of the rights that international law protects, and how that might relate to the motion that you're talking about. Um, so I think that there is a necessity for this lecture, um, and I wish that I had had something similar to listen to um, when I was debating, because I think that the phrase X violates international law um, is something that's thrown out a lot in rounds, um, something that I'm sure I've thrown out, especially when I was a newer debater, something that I'm sure you all have either heard or said um, is this, this motion violates international law because ABC. And I think that often in these cases, this is kind of a last ditch effort um, at, at making an argument um, or it's kind of grandstanding and trying to um, make a claim that's not fully supported um, because I think international law is just uh, very difficult to understand, um, much more nuanced than domestic law. Um, and so I think that when um, we think of international law as something as cut and dry as a 50,000 page book that lists all the laws, um, then I think that we kind of just assume like, oh, oh, this must be in there. Like this must be something that, um, something that is protected in international law that this motion violates and we don't do the rest of the work. Um, and so we can't say with 100% certainty um, exactly how that law is created, um, who it applies to. Um, and I think that that doesn't give us a lot to work with to have less um, less surface level debates. Um, so this lecture is for you if you've ever heard this or said this in a round, um, and I know I have. So first, um, we're going to talk about just an overview of international law, and then we're going to talk about the institutions that create um, and enforce that law. Um, and then we'll be talking about how this relates to your debating in worlds and then we'll be doing a five to 10 minute drill um, that you'll be able to uh, do on your own and submit. Um, so first let's talk about the international legal order. Um, the international legal order is just a technical term um, for international laws, the bodies that create them, the bodies that enforce them, um, everyone they apply to, the civil society organizations such as Amnesty International, the Human Rights Watch um, that, that monitor, adherence to international law um, that apply pressure to states. It's the way that every actor that's related to international law and the law itself um, interacts in a system. That system is called the international legal order. Um, and that is a, a technical term that you, you don't really have to know for anything, um, but that kind of helps frame our lecture. Um, so first, I think the first step in defining international law um, is to say that today we're talking about public international law. Um, instead of private international law. Public international law is probably what you think of when you're thinking of international law. It's the law that regulates the actions of states, states meaning countries, nations, um, rather than individual people, which is what private international law regulates. Public international law, here's a technical definition on the screen um, from my international law textbook. I didn't attribute it here, um, but that's where it's from. And it's the body of law that directs or regulates legal relations between states acting as such. Um, so states acting as such, that means the country of the United States on behalf of the country of the United States um, and the law that regulates the relationship between the United States and the country of Mexico. So that's different from private international law um, where individuals have legal standing, um, which means that that law, um, that an individual can use the law um, to sue another individual um, in a different country. Um, that means that that law applies to an individual. Um, public international law applies to and is created by states. 
Um, so this is different from something like an international business transaction and the laws that regulate that. Um, that regulate the laws of corporations and of those individuals working for the companies. Um, public international law, in public international law, only states, nations, countries have standing. So only states, um, can, the, the law applies to states and then states can also use the law um, to hold other states accountable for following it. Okay, so um, we already said that international law is not a 500,000 page book that you can read, have all the laws listed out, um, although that would be so helpful. Unfortunately, that is not what it is. Um, so let's talk about the different sources that create international law. First, there's the, the more tangible one, um, and this is treaties. So treaties are uh, documents that countries create, sign, ratify, and they enter into an agreement together um, to follow those laws um, to follow the, the agreement they just agreed to that now becomes international law um, once they sign it and ratify it. And it applies to any country that participated in that, that signed it and ratified it and created it. Um, that's the, the cut and dry example. That's what we all know. Um, NAFTA, for example, was created by a treaty, right, between countries. Um, then the more abstract version um, is customary international law. So this is international law that binds countries to follow it, that, um, that governs the way that countries interact, um, that's not written down, that wasn't signed, that wasn't um, made into law with the signature and ratification by a country of that specific treaty. Um, so how is customary international law formed? You can think of this as kind of what becomes international law based on the norms um, the kind of the equivalent for in like interpersonal relationships of etiquette. This is the norms, the etiquette between countries um, that it's, it's just what you do. It's just the law, it's just what it is. Um, that's the super simplified version. There's going to be a lot of nuance throughout this lecture, um, a lot of technical aspects of international law. As long as you're getting the big picture, you're good. You can come back and listen. If you have a motion three weeks later that makes you think of this um, and you wanna come back to it, um, but I'll always try to break down the big concept and the technical terms as well. Um, and you can pause it, take notes um, as, as you go to help you um, kind of find what's important and what you think will apply to motions. Um, so customary international law is formed um, from a few concepts. So first there's state praxis or state practice. And this is basically what states do. So say, this is not entirely true, but say that 150 states have domestically outlawed the death penalty um, within their country. State practice would say that a lot of states or state praxis, they're interchangeable, would say that a lot of states um, have outlawed the death penalty. So that creates what's called opinio juris, which is when states act because they think or believe that the law requires them to act in a certain way. So say that the United States hasn't entered into a treaty, hasn't entered into an agreement, um, that says uh, we agreed to outlaw the death penalty. But they know that 150 other states have outlawed the death penalty. So the United States starts to think maybe, um, maybe it violates international law for us to carry out the death penalty. Maybe we'll face retribution from other states for doing that. International law essentially exists insofar as states are willing to hold each other accountable for following it. So if a state like the United States is carrying out the death penalty and then becomes concerned that other states are, um, are going to think that that violates international law and the United States is going to face retribution, the United States thinking that contributes to a cycle in which um, outlawing the death penalty becomes a part of international law. Um, that's just based on the norms and customs of the way that states um, interact with one another. So state practice, what states actually do, that can create opinio juris, which is a process when it's a fairly circular process, when a state thinks that they're bound by a certain law, that something is international law, and by them continuing to believe that, it creates that law where they bind other states um, to also act the same way. Um, another thing within customary international law um, are the use Kogan's principles. Um, and these are, are different from opinio juris, but related. Um, and you could say that they were created by the same process of opinio juris. Um, so the use Kogan's principles are, they include four things, um, slavery and the slave trade, piracy, torture, and genocide. 
And these are the four Yuskogin's principles that are known as peremptory non-derogable norms of international law. And what that means is essentially that all states agree that these four things violate international law, whether or not states have entered into a treaty that outlaws them, um, whether or not state practice is against them, um, all, all states, th there is no debate here. States agree that slavery and the slave trade, piracy, torture, and genocide violate international law. Um, a state's response to another state accusing them of committing genocide is not, yes, we are, and that's legal. It's no, we are not committing genocide, right? So you see how that works is states don't admit to, um, don't admit to committing these four, to violating these four principles. Um, they, they, um, they, they don't admit to doing it and argue that it's legal. They would try to conceal that they're doing that, doing it. And so that kind of shows that all states agree that these four things are illegal under international law. Um, so here's an example to kind of review these three concepts and break it down a little bit. Um, so if we look at the example of genocide, genocide was not made illegal by a treaty until 1948 under international law. That was the Geneva Convention in 1948 was a treaty um, that countries entered into, um, signed, ratified, said genocide is illegal, we will not commit genocide. However, states very widely agreed before that, that committing genocide is a violation of international law, right? That's why states were viewed as justified when they responded to the German government committing the Holocaust. Um, states didn't really uh, wonder, are we violating international law by impeding on their sovereignty, um, by impeding on Germany's sovereignty? Um, they said Germany is committing a genocide, that violates international law. We think that under customary international law, um, it wasn't necessarily called that at the time, but this is the process that happened. Um, we think that under customary international law, we're justified in, um, in impeding on Germany's sovereignty to ensure that they can't continue to violate international law by carrying out a genocide. Um, so even though there wasn't a treaty um, that, made inter that made genocide illegal, until 1948, it was viewed as illegal under international law far before that, based on a, being a use Kogan's principle um, and also being a use Kogan's principle under um, customary international law, it was illegal. Um, use Kogan's principles are peremptory and non derogable norms of international law. Peremptory just means that they're primary to anything else. Um, you can't compromise your commitment to a use Kogan's principle to not violating um, those four principles um, based on a treaty that you signed with another country um, that says uh, that slavery is an integral part of both countries' um, trading systems and will be recognized um, because slavery is seen as such an immoral act that it's a use Kogan's principle, it's primary to anything else. Um, and non-derogable um, has a similar meaning. It means that you cannot draft a treaty, can't create a treaty, um, that derogates from that norm. So that um, kind of excuses a behavior that violates the use Kogan's principle. Um, you can't create a new treaty that does away with one of those principles. Um, and then this chart essentially just summarizes everything we've talked about, the international legal order um, and three main sources of international law. So this chart um, talks about the UN charter um, which is the foundational treaty of the United Nations um, that I'm sure you all have heard of. And what this does was essentially set up the structure of the UN, um, but then also rules governing member states between the UN. So it's a very large instrument in international law um, itself. And then it breaks down just kind of three considerations and elements, legal elements, moral elements, and human rights elements that went into the creation of that. Um, and then international law in this chart symbolizes um, international treaties and international agreements that are recognized by all states or by a large body of states that govern the way that a lot of states interact with each other. And then international treaties and legal instruments um, discuss more of like bilateral agreements between two states, um, bilateral agreements between three, four states that enter into a treaty together um, and agree to free trade, for example. Um, that would create international law that's binding only on those nations that entered into that specific treaty. Um, and so you see customary international law um, plays into international law that regulates a lot of states, the perceived way that a lot of states interact with each other, adhere to that law. And then international treaties and legal instruments can also be governed by kind of practices that are standard between those states, that those states 
if one state were to not do that, it would be viewed as a violation by another state. Um, so there's a parallel in, in regulations between individual states as well. Um, but international customary law applies to what governs all states. Um, so international customary law, if it exists, it binds, it binds everyone. Okay, and then I think this is one of the more challenging parts of understanding um, international law, and it's the enforcement mechanism of international law. What happens if international law is violated? So international law exists. You determine that something is legal, illegal under customary international law or under a treaty. Um, and then how is, in, how is it enforced? Um, so the first option is force or coercion. Um, so force is permitted under international law in very rare circumstances. We talked about the UN Charter, that foundational document of the United Nations. Article 51 of the UN Charter, um, super interesting to read, would recommend looking it up. Um, if you wanna just Google it while I'm talking, you can. Um, so Article 51 of the UN Charter authorizes the use of force by member states, by states in the UN, only in the case of self-defense or if all other means have been exhausted. Um, so international law under the UN Charter does allow for force, does allow for war to ensue, but only in very limited circumstances. Um, and there's a pretty major process to go through within the UN um, for that to be approved. However, another example of force or coercion um, is sanctions. So if a state were to sanction another state, that would be using economic force um, to get them to comply with the law would be the end goal, um, or to get them to comply with a behavior that a state perceives to violate international law. Um, they say we're imposing sanctions until you change your behavior. Um, that would be an example of force. Um, another example is consent. And this is what happens when states sign and ratify treaties. They know that it's going to be beneficial to them in the long run, to their alliances, to their relationships with other states, to not facing retaliation by other states, to make law um, and to consent to following it. Um, and so this is what happens. Um, when states create law um, by signing treaties and then sign and ratify that. Um, and then there's also the example of soft power. Um, and soft power is a term that was coined by Joseph Nye, who's um, an international relations theorist. The name is not super important. I'm sure he would disagree. Um, but Joseph Nye described soft power as the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion. This is really similar to what I described with consent, um, but he sees strong relations with allies economic assistance programs and cultural exchanges as examples of soft power. Um, and so this is when um, you ensure that international law is adhered to um, by building strong relationships with other states, um, so much so that they see the benefits of, that, of complying with that law um, and don't want to negate it. And then there's the example of liminal spaces. So liminal spaces are kind of this third space that doesn't necessarily have standing in international law, um, but that does influence international law. So I have a list over here of the principal actors in international law, and you'll see like domestic and international institutions. So those are governments, um, the UN, domestic governments, the government of the United States, um, individuals. Um, individuals don't have standing under international law, but they play a part in it. Um, because they live in the states that are governed by it. And then you have civil society institutions. Um, so this is like non-governmental organizations, NGOs like Amnesty International and the Human Rights Watch that monitor adherence to international law and put pressure on states by publishing reports that say that a country isn't complying with international law. Um, and so in doing so, they help to hold states accountable. So that's liminal spaces. Um, and then also domestic enforcements. Um, so this is when states adopt international law into their own domestic law and then hold citizens accountable for following it or hold corporations accountable for following it to ensure that citizens aren't violating international law or international rights of other citizens of that state. Um, so an example would be the United States codifying asylum law within their own domestic government. Asylum is a right that's discussed in a lot of international law. And so when the United States creates a process for claiming asylum within US law, that's the domestic enforcement of international law. Great. And then next we're going to talk about international institutions, international bodies, um, and just a few that you could know that often come up um, in motions themselves um, or that you can talk about um, that within arguments that just kind of help you understand who all of the actors are who are actually creating international law and holding states accountable for following it. Um, feel free to take about two minutes here, um, go get water, pet your dog, close your eyes, stretch a little, do them all at the same time. 
um, if, if you're feeling adventurous, um, just to take a little screen break um, and then come back. So feel free to pause here, um, but I will just keep going. So the first example um, that we're going to look at is the United Nations. Obviously, this is, this is a biggie in international law. Um, and then with each of these, we're also going to look at some critiques of the institutions. This is just a primer. I would recommend if this is something that interests you, spending some time um, reading about critiques of these institutions, how they were formed, um, the disproportionate role that Western governments have had in forming them, and how that perpetuates imbalances in power that continue to exist with which states have access to power in these institutions and which states don't. Um, so to talk a little bit about the United Nations, the United Nations Charter was signed at a conference in San Francisco in June of 1945, so that was immediately following World War II, right? Um, and the United Nations Charter Convention and signing was led by four main countries, um, and that was Britain at the time, uh, China, the Soviet Union, and the United States. Um, so this kind of explains the distribution of power that currently exists. Um, there is an organizational systems chart um, on the screen here, and you can follow this link. Um, it's pretty in depth, so you don't have to don't have to grasp all of it. But it'll show you kind of a breakdown of the different bodies that I'm going to talk about that exist within the United Nations. Um, if you want to spend some extra time trying to understand that, if that's something that interests you. Um, but what I would say you need to know is that there is the UN Security Council. The Security Council is what deals with the use of force with Article 51 that I was talking about earlier. Um, the UN Security Council binding is kind of a relative term in international law, but the UN Security Council is the only organization, only organ within the UN that can pass laws that are legally binding, meaning that the violation of them could lead to the use of force. Um, so only laws that are passed by the UN Security Council are considered to be binding. Um, laws that are passed by other parts of the UN often make their way into customary law um, or treaties that are signed within other parts of the UN make their way into customary law. And so states bind one another to follow them. Um, but for all like theoretical purposes, the only thing that's actually binding um, in terms of the, the use of force being justified in retaliation for not following them um, is that which is passed by the UN Security Council. So there's a lot of power that lies there. Um, and on the UN Security Council, there are five states that have veto power. That's the United States, Britain, China, France, and Russia. Um, and so you see how that kind of made its way from the formation of the UN um, to which states have veto power there. So if, if a state vetoes something that's under review by the UN Security Council, then it doesn't pass. So the United States, Britain, China, France, and Russia um, have kind of unilateral power um, to stop anything from happening within the UN. Um, and this, this often, um, looks like stopping peacekeeping troops and forces from going into a certain state in the midst of a genocide or a human rights crisis. That's something the UN Security Council would be voting on that would be big and important. Um, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of treaties that exist don't, and treaties that make their way into customary law, um, don't happen within the UN Security Council. They happen in what's called treaty monitoring bodies. So CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, um, the UN Human Rights UN Human Rights Commissioner, the UN um, High Commissioner for Refugees, um, those are all treaty monitoring bodies. There are governing documents um, that exist within those bodies. Um, the majority of states have representation within those bodies. They work on more specific issues and there are several treaty monitoring bodies that exist. Um, the treaties that monitor those bodies like there's the CEDAW Convention for the Com uh, Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women Convention. That's a treaty that exists um, that is not technically binding on states because it wasn't passed by the Security Council, um, but most states view it as binding um, and will enforce it um, through the various means that we talked about earlier. Um, and it's made its way into customary law. Um, so when state practice largely supports something within one of those treaties, it's widely widely acted upon, widely agreed upon to be part of an, of international law, um, then, um, then that's something that states will enforce, will hold one another accountable to in theory. Um, in theory is a big part of international law. Um, it's, it's messy, so, so hang in there. Um, you don't have to figure it out in this 30 minute lecture. Um, no one has figured it out in their lifetime. So just, just hang in. Um, and that I think take, takes care of a lot of what we want to talk about with the UN.
Um, so next is the ICC. This is the International Criminal Court. Something that's important to recognize is that you can't just um, implement international law by going to court. Um, something that I think that like I wrote into a speech for a class like freshman year of high school um, was like, well, if they violate this provision of international law, like they'll, they'll just go to the ICC because I thought that's how it worked. Um, and it's not quite, the ICC exists for um, very specific purposes. It's not an arbiter of all violations of international law, only for kind of things that I was talking about earlier that align with the use Kogan's principles, but not, not just the use Kogan's principles. Um, but states can take other states to trial within the ICC for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of aggression. Um, and even then, um, this require this isn't necessarily forceful. It requires a lot of consent from states. Um, so the ICC can issue an arrest warrant. Um, and then for an individual within a state who committed a genocide, um, and then the state has to comply, has to turn in that individual, um, and has to turn them over to the ICC um, to stand for trial. Um, so there's a lot of consent that's involved here as well. The ICC um, is not, not a powerful body that's an arbiter of all human rights violations. It was created in 2002 by the Rome Statute, and it has 123 member countries currently that could theoretically be taken to trial within the ICC. Um, it was created following the failed response to genocides in Darfur and Rwanda um, as a place where those where individuals who were guilty of war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and crimes of aggression could be taken to court. Um, within the ICC. Um, there are some critiques of it as well, that it's inefficient, that it's slow to act, that it's ineffective, um, all again, because it exists within international law and requires so much consent to operate that's often not given. Um, NATO was, um, NATO uh, exists for the purpose of collective defense, um, often to enforce provisions of international law. Article five, um, of the treaty that founded NATO um, says that countries will act in collective defense of one another. Um, so countries will often contribute troops to the NATO forces. The NATO forces will be used to protect member countries um, within, within NATO. So there are 12 founding members and 30 current members. And NATO is currently active in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Mediterranean maritime patrol, patrols, um, Iraq, and in Somali. Um, some critiques that it impedes sovereignty of nations um, be, because the forces, um, the NATO forces um, do act within states that are not member states. They just act to protect states that are member states, um, that there's excessive intervention, um, as I said, and then kind of a critique from the other side, a critique that Donald Trump would wield um, at NATO is that there's a funding imbalance um, that states like the United States um, that have more resources are paying more than states like Somali that may be benefiting from NATO. Um, then there's the IMF and World Bank. Um, and these are lending institutions. Um, the World Bank is a lending institution. It's like a bank for the world, World Bank. The IMF is a watchdog of monetary policies and exchange rate policies. Um, and it, these two together create what's called the Bretton Woods system. Um, they were created in 1944. They have 189 member um, countries. These are the international institutions that regulate economic relationships um, between countries. And there are a lot of critiques of these two, including um, some related to imperialism and neocolonialism. Um, the same disproportionate funding argument is here. Um, I think it's definitely important to spend some time looking at the critiques of these institutions um, because economic relationships between countries come up a lot in worlds. Um, one that I'd like to highlight is William Easterly is a political scientist um, who wrote a book called The White Man's Burden, um, not, not the poem, but named in reference to it. Um, and he argues that there are a lot of economic reforms um, that the IMF um, requires of countries and that the World Bank requires of countries in order to receive funding. Um, in order to receive lending, um, the, the IMF and the World Bank give loans, um, such as fiscal austerity, high interest rates, trade liberalization, privatization of markets, and um, open capital markets um, within countries that are receiving funding. And so he argues that this is counterproductive for the development of those countries and makes them reliant on Western countries. Um, and so that's, that's one critique you can look into there um, if you're interested. And then there's the EU. Um, so, you know, this 
uh, this is an example of a regional block, which also is an institution that um, implements international law. It was established in 1993. There are 28 member countries. Um, the benefits of European countries entering into the EU um, include that there's free trade within the EU, free movement within the EU, um, but there are also critiques of it, um, including some like populist critiques um, about um, that, that stem from uh, nationalism, um, that don't like the immigration that happens between the borders of EU member states. Um, you know this organization for um, the UK's uh, Brexit, for the UK's exit of the EU, um, known as Brexit, um, which was fueled by a lot of these critiques. Okay, and then you have the WTO, which is similarly um, an economic instrument, an economic institution um, established in 1995. There are 164 member countries, and this essentially manages the rules of international trade and dispute settlements. Um, this deals with both public international law and the private international law that we discussed earlier um, as being agreements between individual corporations, companies. Um, there are a lot of critiques of the WTO. If you've heard of the 1999 Seattle protests, those were directed at the WTO, um, and there was a coalition of a lot of groups that focused on opposing certain WTO policies, especially those related to free trade. Um, and so there were a lot of labor groups, anti-capitalist groups and environmentalist groups um, that protested the WTO. Um, and then the liminal spaces that we talked about earlier. Here's a quote um, that I think describes liminal spaces really well. Liminal space is a term used um, outside of international law as well, but in international law it refers to those organizations that put pressure on states that aren't governments um, that are made up of people. So these are areas of clash, just kind of summarized. You can read through them um, that we talked about uh, throughout the individual, um, throughout reviewing the individual institutions, but disproportionate power, disproportionate access to decision-making power, um, a disproportionate representation that leads to that disproportionate power um, often is tied up with critiques of Western imperialism, um, infringements on sovereignty, especially of non-Western nations, um, and then a lack of enforcement power um, also exists a critique about the UN um, and international institutions not having enough power to enforce international law um, is kind of the opposite side of the coin with infringements on sovereignty. Um, and then also national expenses. There are often critiques that stem from countries that they're putting too much um, of their resources in and not getting enough out. Um, okay, so um, our drill is coming up soon. But first to recap, the reason that this is relevant to debate um, is that a lot of a lot of motions rely directly on having this content knowledge. Again, this is just a brief primer. So your, your research for handling a motion like this should not just be this lecture, um, but this is just kind of giving you an overview of how all of these institutions and laws interact. Um, but a motion like this house would cancel permanent membership and veto power in the UN Security Council is a motion that would directly implement this content knowledge, but also, um, Arguments related to international law can help building principal and practical arguments, even when the motions don't explicitly address international law, um, like this motion, for example, I think will help make that a little bit clearer. Um, so for the drill, what you're going to do is write one argument. Um, so as a recap, um, because I'm not sure which uh, lectures you all have seen before this one, um, as a recap, this um, writing an argument typically means you have a tagline, um, that you would use on the proposition or opposition. Um, and then you support that and you can incorporate two layers if you'd like to um, within that argument, um, just kind of like two sub points within the argument. Um, so the motion, this house believes the Gulf states should take in more Syrian refugees. Um, what I'd like you to do is look at different provisions of international law, um, at treaties, at customary law, and make an argument about how international law relates to this obligation. Um, I said two layers, but really international law um, could could likely only lead to one layer. So um, if you're in gold and silver, I would say just go for one layer. If you're in red or blue, go for two. Um, so you're going to take a stance that there is an obligation under international law for Gulf states to take in more Syrian refugees, or you can take the opposite stance. Um, and this is going to be probably the tag of your argument. Um, and then you're going to explain this, justify it, say what the obligation is, where it arises from, 
um, the consequences of not abiding by it. You could talk about enforcement if you'd like. Um, and only this lecture went a bit long. So only spend about five to 10 minutes on this. Um, set a timer for yourself for what you wouldn't, what you'd like to not go over five or 10 minutes. Um, just write, outline what you can. Um, the main purpose of this is just research to spend a little bit of time reviewing those documents um, and state practices that make up international law. Um, there's also an optional reflection, just if you have some time, if you're thinking about it, if you were interested in this um, and wanted to read an article like this anyways, um, I think it's always helpful to kind of reflect on our positionality, especially as a U.S. debate um, program um, or program based in the United States. Um, just take a few minutes, read an article about a current issue or development related to international institutions and international law. Um, that the US is playing a role in. Um, there's a lot happening right now. Well, and there will be in two weeks as well when you all are watching this, I'm sure, um, with the US's role in international law. Um, if you do read an article, be sure to post the link in this doc. And if you'd like, um, post a quick summary so that we can all read it. Um, and as a review, international law regulates actions between states. It's made up of norms, customary international law, as well as binding law and treaties that states agree to enter into. The enforcement of international law is not as cut and dry as domestic law. You can't just go to court. There are multiple um, multiple um, elements of international law governing when you can use force. Um, you can also use coercion, such as um, economic sanctions. Um, states often see it as beneficial to them because of um, soft power or consent. Um, to enter into international law, liminal spaces, um, civil society groups also place pressure on states to abide by international law. Um, and then also just a general note, just make sure that you're doing the research to talk about international law with nuance and specificity. If there's one thing to take away from this lecture, um, it's that a complete response, a complete rebuttal is not, well, this violates international law. Um, just be sure to do the research to dig into it a little bit further. And this was a very nuanced lecture, totally get that. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, you don't need to understand every nuance of everything that was said. Um, I just wanted to throw a lot of information out there so that you have the tools um, to pick it all apart. So thank you so much everyone for spending your time with me and have a great rest of your day at GDS.